So, ketamine is an induction sedative agent. It's an antagonist of the NMDA receptor. For sedation, we use 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV uh, with repeat doses of 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV, Q5, 10 minutes. To induce general anesthesia, we do about 2.5 to 3 mg per kg IV. Boom. Some people use a little bit less. That's what I use. Um, nausea vomiting, it occurs like really badly in about 1 in... 20, sometimes 1 in 25. I think one number quoted is somewhere between 4 and 8%. On Danstron pretreatment helps. The only study that, that I know of that's really, really good for this is uh, from the 2008, the Annals of, Internal Med uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine by Langston, WT, et al. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial where they gave on Danstron versus placebo to see if they could change ketamine, the vomiting associated with ketamine sedation. Number needed to treat of 9. So you, you treat nine people, you eliminate that completely. So let's talk about things that are good about ketamine and some of its properties. Briefly, it's a bronchodilator, so really useful for induction in COPD and asthma. Okay. It is not a hemodynamically neutral. People talk about agents like Atominate as being hemodynamically neutral. It's not. It actually uh, causes a, a catecholamine surge. So it increases heart rate, increases, increases blood pressure which is great, for example, in a problem like sepsis or maybe polytrauma, but mm -hmm. beware in hyperthyroidism, uh, acute coronary syndromes or STEMI, where you're going to have to induce anesthesia for, to intubate or whatever, and dissection. Also, if you know someone has a diagnosis of porphyria, uncommon, then it would be contraindicated in, in that case. People talk about how ketamine doesn't cause respiratory depression, and that's generally true, but if you give a huge whack of it, all at once, like you give a very high push to a, to a maniac on drugs to sedate them. Yeah. There is transient respiratory depression for two to three minutes if you give someone a huge blast of it. Okay. So don't be surprised if that happens. Um, emergency reactions, you know, it varies. For the most time, it doesn't. Some people have bad trips. Some people do. But it's not a common thing. What is important, though, is that if someone has a diagnosis of schizophrenia or hyperthyroidism with psychosis, mm -hmm. even if they're not having it right now, even if they're very, very well controlled, even if five years ago they had an episode of mania with psychosis that required hospitalization, you do not use ketamine for those people. Unless, like, we're talking bad polytrauma and you've got no choice. But for sedation, you would avoid the use of ketamine if someone has any history of psychosis in the past, even if they're well controlled at present. Okay. Don't use under three months of age because of issues with laryngospasm. Okay. So if you give someone ketamine, occasionally you'll see a transient patchy red rash on their upper torso that goes away. That happens with ketamine, no worries. Um, laryngospasm is rare. It happens in 0.4%, about 4 in 1,000, and it's often transient. But when you're going to get it is if you're doing upper airway manipulation or if you're doing it in the setting of hypoxia. So if you, especially in children, so... Okay. So laryngospasm, like I said, higher if you are manipulating the upper airway and higher if there's a structural abnormality or airway infection. So avoid aggressive airway suctioning if you're using ketamine, if you're not planning to intubate them. If you're planning to intubate the child or the patient, no problems. Who cares? Yeah. Right? If they're hypoxic and you're going to give them, no problem. But if you're just going to give them ketamine to do sedation for that hypoglossal, you know, that, that peritonsil or abscess that you're going to drain. Mm -hmm. You might want to consider a different agent. Okay. Possibly for laryngospasm. You know, if, if you're doing dental stuff, you might want to consider a different agent because laryngospasm can happen if you aggressively muck around the airway. Or if a child has congenital airway, as a congenital facial abnormality, then you want to be careful. Um, in hypoxia, especially with children, you have to be careful because hypoxia leads to bradycardia and bradycardia can lead to arrest. So if you have a hypoxic child and then you give them ketamine and then you give them succinylcholine, then you can, so let's say you give, you give someone ketamine in their child and they develop laryngospasm yeah. and then they start becoming bradycardic because they're not breathing and you think, oh shit, now we need to paralyze them to intubate them. 
And then what do you do? You get them succinylcholine. Well, succinylcholine in a child can cause bradycardia, and then you can have a rest on your hands. So if someone has laryngospasm and you can't just bag through it and you need to paralyze them, use rocuronium or becuronium. Okay. Easy enough, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, that's all you really need to know about ketamine. Pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, that's awesome.